without further ado, I, I'd love to hear from Ian Opperman because people will not appreciate that at the same time the HFT debate was going on, just down the road in the rocks, Australia had built the world's best global database of securities tick by tick anywhere on planet Earth. So let's hear it from Ian. Thank you very much. <coughs> so I'm uh, Ian Opperman from Rosetta Technology. We're the company you've never heard of. We are the financial spin-out of the commercial spin-out of a company called Circa, who many of you probably have heard of. It's interesting, um, I am going to talk a little bit about data, but I'm a, I'm a real technology fan, and I, I believe that once you get into a role and start looking at challenges which are either dull, dirty, or dangerous, then robots are a great choice. Once you go beyond the human capacity to respond or the human capacity to understand, then it doesn't matter whether things are trading at millisecond rate or microsecond rate or nanosecond rate, it's all the same. It's far too rapid for us to really intervene and do something about it, at least at the transactional level. Interesting enough, my wife is a lawyer, uh, in fact a barrister. I realised that when we got married that I would never win another argument, but it hasn't stopped me from having opinions. And one of the things that, that I argue strongly is that data, well in the, in the physical world, sunlight's a great disinfectant. In the world, the virtual world, the data-driven world, the data itself is a great disinfectant. It's the sort of thing which can really expose, shed real light on some of, the, some of the, the darker things that happen. It allows people to understand really what's going on as opposed to what they think is going on. And through my career, uh, before joining Rosetta Technology, I was with CSIRO, Chief of Division, a lot of work in robotics, a lot of work in, in e-health, a lot of work in e-government, a lot of work looking to bring data-driven decision-making tools, evidence-based decision-making tools to play. And before that, I was with a company called uh, Nokia. They used to make mobile phones. They don't do that anymore. But uh, I was on the unsexy side of the business, which was the networks business. And one of the things that happened in the networks business is it got a lot of competition. Every single country had more than one major mobile phone operator, and there was incredible pressure to innovate. So what happened is that we developed tools which originally started hypothesizing this is what the network should look like, but we developed tools that actually said, this is what's going on in the network. Pull the data out of the network. Every single interaction, I have one of the last Nokia's for anyone interested, every single interaction this phone has with the network is something I can capture. Every interaction that I have with this device, I can capture. And I can use that to improve the quality of experience of that customer and how well the phone operates in the network. Then, of course, you can capture every part of the billing side of the network. So that's called the OSS, the Operation Support System. But then some really clever things started to happen in the billing side of the system. And the, the software behind billing is astronomical. It's huge, many, many, many hundreds of millions of lines of code, far more than was ever used to launch a space shuttle, for example. And it allows things like this second-by-second second billing, rating, charging of users. The network is doing a credit check on you every second to see whether or not your call can keep going for the next second. And that's for prepaid and for postpaid. And that sophistication allows things like the payment systems to happen in the Philippines. In fact, I was with Nokia long enough to actually see that start to happen. And people use phones in really innovative ways. We saw it in India, we saw it in, in sub-Saharan Africa, we saw it in different parts of Asia. But the whole point really is that you've got these incredibly powerful systems and when combined, you know every interaction the user has with the phone, the phone has with the network and that that user has with the billing system. So that led to something called customer experience management. Take all of that data about every, every interaction with the network and then flip it on its head and make the user the center and a whole new world was created where you could actually start to look at who were your highest earners, who were your, your highest spenders in the network, who were the ones you really wanted to keep, who were the ones that you would, would afford to churn, where you allocated your precious resources. And through my career, the, 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 the combining of data has been something which is really powerful. An example from CSIRO in the healthcare system. If you think financial services are complex, you should look at the healthcare system. It's unbelievable. But using data, we're able to predict who was going to walk in the door today, tomorrow, 
next Tuesday, next October, with what sort of injuries? And you could do that and say there would be four people with trip and fall. There'd be someone coming in with a, with a hip problem. You could predict that in four hour blocks quite a long way into the future by looking at the data for the hospital records itself and then starting to bring together weather data, information about social events that were going on, information about pollen count. And it was absolutely amazing the accuracy that you could predict what was going to happen. And the, the first trial of this happened to be during schoolies week and it was the, the thing that happens on the Gold Coast with the Logan Hospital. And the results were just amazing in terms of how accurate, what sort of injuries. They wouldn't tell you the person, they wouldn't say it's, it's David's son or daughter. It would say that three people will come in the next four hours with these sort of injuries. So the power there really was combining different data sets together and doing something which allowed much greater insight to be developed. So during the course of my career, I've, I've learned a couple of things, um, apart from don't try and win an argument with a barrister. Data is really hard to get. Behind all of these systems, there are, there are lots of different reasons why you can't get access to the data. Linking just the OSS and the BSS systems together was an incredible challenge, which required hundreds of, of people to work collaboratively to just, just to link two systems which are owned by an operator. There's lots of reasons why you can't do it. One of the, the examples in the healthcare system that is, is because so many documents are still used to capture data. So there's, there's all sorts of reasons, the unwilling, unable, and in some cases the not allowed, which actually speaks to the regulatory uh, situation. And there are lots of cultural challenges, there are legal challenges, there are regulatory challenges, and there are challenges associated with just getting stuff off paper in some cases. The other lesson is that data is powerful when you combine it. And the OSS BSS example is, is a really interesting one that unleashed hundreds of billions of dollars of value and created a brand new industry around customer experience management. The, the, the point though is that the more data you can bring to bear on a problem, the deeper insights you can get or the more questions you could ask that you couldn't ask before. Who are my highest spenders? How many of my radio resources should I put into keeping that group as opposed to letting others churn? The other big lesson about data is that there's always a human in the loop somewhere. So I, I mentioned, I started by saying that with algorithmic trading or high-frequency trading, once you get beyond the, the human ability to respond, it doesn't matter whether it's nanosecond or whether it's microsecond or whether it's something even much higher frequency than that. But encoded in all those algorithms, there's someone's judgment. There's someone making a decision about what's good or bad. There's someone making a decision about what to do when something happens. So what we do as a company, what Rosetta does, the company you've, you've hopefully now heard of, is that we manage large amounts of data. Historically, it's been market transaction data. We have the world's largest financial market database. One of, one of our favorite customers came over to see us and said, we'd like a copy of the data. And we said, sure, we handed a memory stick. And we said, we'll cut you some hard drives. <laughs> We've had someone we employed specifically to do this working since last September, cutting hard drives. We realized that we would fill the hold of a 747 with the data sets that we've got. So that's a lot of data. But we're now keeping data on property, on weather, on soil moisture, leaf wetness, temperature, humidity, on tectonic plate movement, on chaotic behavior of nonlinear lasers. Because all of this is the sort of thing that given your problem, or in fact, given your question, these are the sorts of data sets that you can bring to bear and really provide incredible insight as to what's going on in your market, where to put your next store, where do I build my next shop, when do I harvest my crops, or where was Australia 100 million years ago? All of these problems, whether they're markets-based, whether they're financial-based, whatever the case may be, can be informed by large amounts of data that you can bring to bear in a really powerful way. So we spend our time building tools that monitor, detect, report, identify, model, analyze, optimize, principally for financial markets. And these are the sort of tell me when, show me this, compare me to this, find another one like that. And these are really simple tools which provide really incredible insight for people who are still making decisions in what we call wetware. But they provide really powerful insight and give you a completely different perspective on things. 
And one of the great things about being Rosetta Technology with the history we've got and the, the relationship we have with our customers is that it's a really, really short period of time between we've had a good idea, one of our academic partners, one of our researchers, one of our staff has a good idea, to actually getting it in front of a customer. It's a really, really rapid turnaround. And I think to your point earlier, this is a domain, this is an area where innovation is going to be incredibly disruptive. And when a small number of companies define the rules, where they rely on information asymmetry, they know more than you, therefore you go to them, that's absolutely ripe for disruption. And part of our job, I think, is to, to drive that disruption. We can create some real benefit, but we can also create some public good because data is as the, the, the best disinfectant for people hiding in dark spaces. Thank you, Ian. Um, I wanted to bring in some of the other panellists. Uh, we've heard a lot about data, electronic trading and so on, and, and Ben, I, I know that uh, you know in, in your whole enterprise, you're investing a range of these. Uh, I know Stuart is, is keen to use data in peer-to-peer -peer lending, and of course Sandy uh, really knows about disruption in, in, in the Silicon Valley community. So please, Ben, would you um, offer your thoughts on that? Sure, thanks, Kingsley. Um, so picking up on a, a couple of ideas, uh, AWI is a little business that's investing in, in early stage fintech businesses. So we've invested in um, uh, and I think 14 businesses, 11 of which are, are small early stage businesses uh, across the spectrum. And, and the main reason we're doing that is uh, to echo what Ian's just said, we, we think there is a, a disruption coming through financial services, uh, which, to be honest, I don't think the big, big banks necessarily see coming. Maybe they do see it, but they're, they're hanging on to what they've got for as long as they can hang on to that, which is going to be... Um, uh, tectonic. It, it, it really will be um, much bigger than, than a lot of people perceive. I also think it'll happen much more quickly than people perceive, albeit that won't necessarily be this year or next year. So, so it'll take a little bit of time, but when it goes, it'll, it'll go with, with gusto. So, you know, really bluntly, we think if we make a series of, of smart bets in, in, in little businesses, uh, in this space where half a chance that some of those will end up being very big businesses. Th there's a couple of themes that, that permeate the way we're thinking about the space and what we're seeing. Uh, the first of those is that a lot of the things we're seeing uh, are about the customer experience. So, and, I, and by that I specifically mean the end customer experience. And that's a bit of a change, this idea, this, this everyone's become all very gung-ho about fintech now. now. Half the people didn't know what it meant a year ago, but suddenly it is the business to be in. Now, fintech, financial services technology, has been around forever. Um, uh, a good, clever fintech's been going on, well, the Tyro's been doing it for 11 years, and companies well before that uh, have been doing it. It's just the, it's traditionally been more B2B fintech, you know, service providers to banks. And, and there's a lot of smart stuff that's going on behind the scenes and part of the reason big Australian banks make $30 million of profit is they've got very efficient in what they do. And the general rule, not much of that has flowed back to improve pricing and so on to the retail consumer. Now, we see the evolution at the moment is about services to the end consumer. So, Stuart will speak about P2P lending in a moment, that's a great example of getting the end consumer closer to, to a solution. And, and to, 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 to points earlier, it's, it's really important that we don't allow existing structures, um, and in part that's the existing banks, to, to sort of control how those processes work. The, the second theme that, uh, that I think is important to us is, is engagement. Now, this is one that Kingsley actually raised in his opening remarks. It's one, I'm, I'm probably speaking specifically about wealth, w which is a space I know well. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll just use a, uh, uh, an example to sort of give you a sense as to what, I, what I'm talking about there is within the wealth space we've, we have a, a, a system that, that's, that's heavily intermediated. So... Um, 
notwithstanding growth of self-managed super, and I'll sort of leave that to the side, we've got a very advisor-led market, and as a general rule, uh, advisors work very hard to make sure that retail consumers depend very heavily on advisors. Now, now some of the regulation, including the, the focal legislation, regulation, um, so certainly the original principles behind focal were great, and, and I think bipartisan support, I think it's sort of been um, uh, uh, bastardised a little bit on the way through the, the process, as sometimes happens. Uh, but, but the concepts behind that are very important. And, and the example I'll use is, um, uh, in my previous role, I, I worked for a big asset manager, and, and, and we developed a product which um, was, a, was, was, and I, I think is, a very good, simple, clean product for the end consumer. It was based around ETF investment, so index fund investment, very cheap, with, a, with an active asset allocation on top, which is a good, sensible way uh, for people to invest. And we price that product at about 30 basis points. So frankly, um, probably 15% a, a, a of what someone would typically pay. And, and we started thinking about how we're gonna name that product. And I boldly suggested we go and find a marketing firm. Um, or, or I think I even suggested we go and hire Coca-Cola's marketing manager and get serious about marketing to retail. And I was quickly put in my place, not least by, by a bunch of our very important clients um, who, who were advisors and represented advisors, one, one of whom was honest. Most gave me all sorts of fabulous reasons why the name had to be complex and so on. But one of which just said it very bluntly, said, listen, if you give this, an, uh, this product a name the consumer will understand, I can't charge 100 basis points on top of that 30 basis point fee. I can't justify to the consumer why my fee needs to sit on top of that. And so he called it the tactical beta conservative and the tactical beta balanced and the tactical beta growth fund because, of course, the man in the street has no idea what that means. So th this, this idea of, um, of sort of transparency so as the end consumer can engage is really important. The, the third point, though, I, I think is most relevant. The third point perhaps brings it back to the, to the really critical role that I see the regulator fulfilling, which is trust. So financial services is a really high trust business. Um, Ian talked about his background a little bit on the health side as well. Health is another industry that, that's, that's, that's very trust orientated and uh, it probably the third one is something like education. Now, it's interesting because those three industries have been slower to be disrupted digitally than have many other industries like media and retail and, and so forth. But that kind of makes sense because if you think about it, the first wave of, of digital evolution uh, 10 or 12 years ago now was things like sort of Google... Alta Vista, does anyone remember Alta Vista? Uh, which were one-to-one, -one, ve uh, sorry, sorry, very much sort of, um, you communicate with a search engine, you don't need to say anything about yourself. And then five years ago, six years ago, we had things like Facebook and Twitter, which was when you started to put a little bit about yourself onto the internet. Banking, financial services, education, health, is when you're putting a lot more information about yourself into the digital realm. So for example, uh, if you are looking to borrow through a P2P lender or you're looking to use a, a robo-advice wealth product, it's a whole different proposition to put your life savings into this digital product with this new name that you haven't really heard of uh, versus using something like Google or, or using something like Facebook. And so that trust element is really key. and, and the role the regulator plays to ensure that the system and the players in the system are seen as fitting within a trusted environment is key. So long as we don't sort of stand in the way of that innovation and, and evolution. And, and you know, I'll just finish by saying there's a it's an interesting press release, but some of you may have heard there's a, there's a US company called Wealthfront. There's another one called Betterment. There's one in the UK called Nutmeg. There's a little one here called Stockspot, who are all doing roughly the same thing, which is providing low-cost, direct-to-consumer wealth solutions. Now, Wealthfront 
recently announced they'd raised another 70 or 80 million dollars in the US, um, which I think took their total capital in the bank to 130 million, and it was a fascinating press release. Uh, in that, it, it, it took me completely by surprise. It, it, it said, we've just raised 70 million and we haven't spent a single dime of the 30 million we raised just two months ago. And I was sort of scratching my head saying, what are you putting that out for? It didn't logically make sense. But having thought about it a little bit and having spoken to a few people, the message they're trying to create is that there's so much money on our balance sheet that you can trust us. So it's a way for them to try and establish sort of brand and credibility in what they do. Now, the advantage our big banks have is you kind of know at the end of the day, if you need to sue them, there's lots of money sitting on the balance sheet. You kind of know at the end of the day, if you need to go to the ombudsman, sort of you'll, 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 be, you'll be sorted out. You, you also know you're going to be ripped off, but within reason, if you can sort of put it that way. On the other hand, if you want to deal with, a, with, a, with an, an early stage company whose name you haven't heard of, that's quite a different proposition. And so this idea of building trust and the role that the regulator has to play to ensure there is trust in the system is something I don't think we want to lose. That's fabulous. Thank you, Ben. Um, I particularly like that um, angle on trust. I think there's a really keen observation there. Martin Place, just outside, if you have a look up and down the facades that were built for our major banks, and you look at the dates when they were built, uh, I think you'll find it's a truism across Australia. Most of the great banking halls were built in the depths of the Depression, and that's why they're so impressive. Uh, trust us. <laughs> we're not the guys going down. So um, on, on the next data front, I think we'll pass to um, Stuart and then, then Sandy. But Stuart, uh, please uh, offer your thoughts on Money Place. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so Money Place is a peer-to-peer -peer lending business. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer lending, an online marketplace that connects borrowers with investors. So this is an opportunity to bypass the banks. And when you think about disruption of financial services, or you think of disruption more broadly, there are a few necessary conditions that you, you look at. And many of these have been touched on in the conversation uh, now and, and also earlier. You know, one of these is, sorry, let me move that forward. That's a bit better. One of these is, is you know, large profit pools. And so we've already talked about how banks are, are hugely profitable. Um, but if I look specifically at consumer lending, consumer lending is about 3% of the bank's balance sheets of their loans, but it contributes 7% of bank profits or, and then it contributes in turn 11% of risk-adjusted profits. And so this is a, a massive, massive profit pool that is ripe for disruption. But then you look to other conditions that are necessary. You look for a lack of product innovation. And so while there's been innovation in, in banking and in financial services in, in payments, for example, and, and there's always something cool happening on a mobile or on a, on a sort of online, but the actual basic business of lending money hasn't really changed. And when you look at the core of that, and you look at things like how you assess credit and how you determine credit worthiness, you've got products in the market that are, a personal loan is 14 and a half, 15%, regardless of who you are. You could be you know, founder of a fledgling startup or you could be the CEO of a very, very successful company earning tens of millions of dollars or almost there as our bank CEOs do. But regardless, you get the same interest rate. So why is that? Why is there no differentiation? And this ties into that concept of fairness a and an objective of fairness for, for FSI doesn't just get to participation and competition, but it needs to look at consumer outcomes. And that leads us into the third element that's necessary for disruption, which is customer dissatisfaction. The banks are happy to rah-rah about their satisfaction rates being all 79, 80% or thereabouts, but really, who's satisfied with their bank? Yes, you know, I'm satisfied with my bank. But when you look to things like an advocacy measure, who actually likes their bank? <laughs> who would recommend their bank? And this is the opportunity. This is the opportunity to disrupt banks, to disrupt financial services. It's not to replace banking but it's to look at an area, a specific segment, and for us, that's consumer lending. For others, it might be small business lending.
but it's to look at an opportunity and say the banks are largely profitable, but there is an opportunity here to be able to create a better value proposition. And what makes that viable is the underlying customer need. So then when you step back from that and say, okay, great, how do we do this? Let, let's launch a peer-to-peer -peer lending business. Let's do that. What can we do? You're then faced, and this sort of echoes the, the, the earlier comments I made, with a, a very rigid regulatory environment. And, and we've been working with the regulators for some time, uh, since sort of early mid last year now, on exactly what is the right way to regulate peer-to-peer -peer lending. There is an approach that says, surely this is an MIS, we've already approved one of those, that's what it's got to be. A and we go, well, maybe, but, but what about an IDPS or, or a subset of, of that? You know, maybe that's more appropriate. And, and it, it should operate like a, a rap, you know, a super rap platform. And, and here's the reasons why. It's like, oh, no, but we can't do that because we've already regulated somebody as a, as a plain vanilla MIS. And then as the regulators receiving applications from, from other companies that are looking to innovate in the space as well around a market's license, because ultimately you want a pure market that enables uh, secondary trading. And so, so there are some companies that have asked for a market's license. It's like, well, hang on, that's completely different to the MIS structure that's plain vanilla that we completely understand and we think we've already put you in this box. And so this is the challenge. How do you deal with innovation? How do you deal with new business models and new concepts? in a space that is as heavily regulated as financial services. And the key here is to be able to actually step beyond that and think about well, what's the end outcome. The end outcome is consumer benefit. The end outcome is, why is it that banks charge me 20% for my credit card but only give me 2% for my term deposit? Why is it that as a retail investor, I can invest in cash, I can invest in property, or I can invest in equities? I don't have enough money to buy into a property because properties are very expensive. I lost a lot of money on equities uh, in the GFC. And you know what, the 2% I'm getting on cash, if I'm lucky, maybe I'm getting 0% on a savings account. Maybe I'm getting a negative rate, as we're seeing sort of has been introduced by some of the investment banks for the privilege of us holding your cash is that we are now gonna charge you for that. Maybe I want something more. And that's where this idea of starting a new market, of being able to create an opportunity that connects both borrowers and investors takes hold. And we've seen tremendous success overseas. Uh, the industry is but only 10 years old. Um, but in that time, you've seen companies like Lending Club innovate and partner with community banks to be able to bring a better proposition to the customers of community banks. You've seen companies like Funding Circle in the UK partner with established banks in a relationship that says, Customers, business customers that you decline loans to, well, don't just leave them in the ether. Refer them to us because we actually think we're better at decision in credit than you. We look at a whole different range, and this comes back to the data sort of comments earlier. So some of the things that we look at versus a bank, for example, is we look at VITA and we look at bureau scores, absolutely. We look at behavioral data around how you applied, how long it took you to complete your application, the time you completed your application. We look at uh, specific bank transaction data that you provide to us through, through another service, through a Yodley service that enables us to look at your personal balance sheet. We look, and, and in some instances, if you look at immigrants and new to, Australia, new, new to country uh, sort of non-residents, there's a massive discriminatory there against you. If you're a student or if you're a graduate and you don't have a credit history, there's discrimination there against you. If you're self-employed, it doesn't matter that you've been a successful whatever self-employed for 10 years and run an incredibly profitable business and you just want some capital to be able to expand your business, the banks will discriminate against you because they don't understand. And so what we need to be able to do is work within a system where we can actually promote innovation and promote an end consumer benefit. But the struggle that we've come up to with the current environment has been the, the uh, existing regulatory framework. And, and that's where hearing, hearing your comments earlier around uh, graduated approach and just the recommendations that have come through from uh, the, the FSI is absolutely right. And if we think about future generations, if we think about industries that are going to take Australia forward, it's financial services and it's also technology. But what we need there is a platform that enables and enables innovation and promotes innovation uh, as opposed to trying to fit that proverbial square peg into a round hole. Thanks so much. Um, before we open it up to the floor, I, I think we've heard some excellent uh, speakers, but we haven't heard from Sandy. 
And uh, just to, I guess, segue into that, um, I personally, if I put my professional investor hat on, uh, yeah, I really think peer-to-peer -peer lending is probably the most dis disruptive thing that's out there right now. And, and the reason for it resides in banking history. Uh, and if I put my research hat on at CIFRA, I think there's a splendid work to be done around banking history because the idea of peer-to-peer -peer lending per se is actually not really that new. It's, it's just disappeared from the scene for a long time, whilst we had a different form of lending based on credit creation. And, and peer-to-peer lending, as uh, several actual contributors uh, in the inquiry, I'd recommend that you read the actual submissions um, who are attempting to explain how peer-to-peer -peer lending works, and indeed those in the mortgage market who've promoted effectively a market-based mechanism uh, for financing uh, home mortgages, which has some similarities to peer-to-peer -peer lending. Um, I think what's really interesting about that is for those banking buffs, fractional reserve banking and peer-to-peer -peer lending, they have historical origins. The best one I know of is the difference between Venetian banking and Florentine banking, both Italian. Um, Venetian banking effectively is peer-to-peer -peer lending. Um, the risk with peer-to-peer -peer lending is you're actually lending somebody's money, you're not creating credit, and you're doing so to finance cargoes, and the big risk is the ship sinks. Uh, so credit risk is what it's all about, and as we've just heard, data is imperative uh, in, in that process. So the Venetians were actually really good at that. Um, then, for various reasons, that got replaced by Florentine banking, which is effectively fractional reserve uh, collateralized banking with collateral from property. Uh, and Florentine banking was quite successful for a while. Uh, but for those who study history, there's a very peculiar feature of uh, Florentine versus Venetian banking systems. Uh, Venetian banking systems tend to last over a period of centuries and they tend to be characterised by a lack of inflation. Florentine banking systems tend not to last very long. Um, their lifetime is usually about 80 to 100 years before they die um, and they're characterised by inflation. Uh, so there's a very disruptive thought to leave you with there um, as I segue into disruption and what it all means with Sandy. Um, just as an introduction, San Sandy spent a lot of time in, in, in the Valley, but you'll hear from her in a minute. Um, I personally have done a lot of business in the US, and what I find interesting about Americans when, when, when you talk about disruption is they're actually disruptive, you know. They'll say something like, is that your lunch? And you go, yeah, that's my lunch. I'm, well, I'm going to eat your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do about it? <laughs> or, or, or in the case of the, the present crop of entrepreneurs in, in the Valley, they go, I'm going to go to Mars. Screw you. Let's do it. Um, now, it might seem like a crazy idea, but um, disruption is a really powerful force. So over to you, Sandy, to explain when it gets disruptive. Um, okay, Andrew. Um, yes, I mean, it's, it's appropriate to, uh, to, to, to pull up the rear here because so many of the panelists have deep expertise in, in uh, either deep legal and transactional um, and, and new markets of banking and finance. I, however, have almost no uh, uh, <laughs> expertise in banking and finance per se, but I do have, uh, you know, a whole career's worth of experience in uh, disruptive markets and technology-driven innovation. Um, and I've had that sort of, I've, I've seen that from about three different vantage points, which I think is sort of unusual and interesting. The first was, um, you know, in journalism. I started my career in business journalism and worked with BRW for a number of years and I was their technology editor, and I was actually so disappointed that I got the technology beat at the time I nearly turned the job down because I just sort of thought, really? I mean, you know, property and politics was, was the Australian sort of, you know, thing in business um, when I started. But I very quickly uh, found that it was the place to be because of the disruptive nature of technology. Um, and not just because of that, but because of how in actually looking at the transformational aspect of technology, how it actually required touch points with every other activity in an ecosystem. The research, the policy, the, the startups, the, you know, the, the just the big ideas and the financing of those big ideas. So I was fortunate to spend a lot of time with a lot of senior global leaders in all of those categories for a number of years. Um, and then I was recruited into venture capital. It was an Australian venture capital company called Allen & Buckridge. It was one of the first venture companies, not the first, but one of the first venture capital companies in Australia that actually really focused on what we call early stage technology. Um, 
you know, private equity in Australia, M&A activity had always been fairly strong. That, but there was almost no funding back 15 years ago. It still isn't, actually. Um, it's getting better, but, uh, but it's still not big. Um, to literally fund Australian technology with global scale and the ability to sort of attack and go for global markets. So, so I was moved um, to San Francisco um, to run and manage uh, Allen and Buckridge office for a, f a few years. And obviously the exposure that I got there from the venture capital um, uh, side of things was, was intense. Um, but often what happens in venture capital is you get access to a lot of different sort of new ideas and, in my, and you tend to fall in love with one or two of them and I, that's what happened to me. It was a Silicon Valley startup called Intertrust. Speaking of trust, we can, uh, we can go into that a little bit because I think it's a really important point but it was a digital rights management technology company had, had patents out the wazoo. That was all the, the value of the company was in the patents in the end. Um, but that company, I joined when there was like 40 people. I wasn't a founder or co-founder. I was just, you know, somebody brought in to help run a particular product division. And there was about 40 people. It was incredibly well funded. It went public within six months of me joining. The share price, this is like, do, this is dot-com, by the way. We weren't a dot-com company. However, we benefited from the dot-com mania, and we also felt the, the, the weight of the chaos of the dot-com bomb. So, um, so we went public, had a market cap of about $8 billion in no time flat, and it was Crazyville, Crazyville, because we haven't really, didn't really have a customer at that point, but we had value. We had, but we were getting there, no, um, and we had value in the technology. So in the end, in the end, um, the company was sold for $435 million on the basis of its patent portfolio to a Sony Phillips consortium who effectively buried it pretty well since then. So it was a defensive claim from Sony and Phillips. So by way of, that's my way of saying I have, I have been in the trenches of, of that. I've been, you know, the, the, the cozy and, and wondrous point of being a commentator and interviewing the global leaders of disruptive companies from Bill Gates to Andy Grove to Scott Min all of those companies. And I spent 15 years in Silicon Valley and in Southern California and recently came back to Australia two, three years ago um, for many, many reasons, um, fa family mostly. But one of them was because I felt that, well, I'd, I'd never really left Australia. I mean, I can, it wasn't like I just disappeared for 15 years and, and never came back. I mean, I was, I was visiting and, and, and working closely with a lot of Australians during that time. But I really felt three, four years ago that something significant was happening in Australia with regard to openness, entrepreneurship, and innovation activity that I certainly hadn't seen in any of my capacities before. And I got really excited. I mean, I was really excited about it. Um, at the same time, I remember like uh, a book came out by George Meg Megreginas called The Australian Moment. Um, it's, a, it's a good book and, and, and I sort of read it because it was a you know, crash refresher in modern Australian political history for one thing. But the, the thesis of the book was that Australians had been brilliant in a bust, the GFC, and had learnt to use their brains in a boom. And that was George's thesis. And so, and there was the NBN was in play and all of that sort of thing. And I thought, this is interesting. Venture capital starting, money starting to happen. I've been back three years and yes, I think there is activity and I think there are pockets of excellence and there's pockets of, um, of entrepreneurship that, that, that I haven't seen. But I have to conclude after three years back that we're not an innovative culture yet. There's a lot more to do. We don't take risk. We don't take, we don't go after those big ideas nearly enough. And I don't think we ever really have. I think that uh, Australia has uh, a very inventive mindset, but innovation is different to invention. Innovation requires commercialization or some sort of putting that invention to good use. We're not doing that as, a, as nearly enough as part of the normal course of business or policy or education yet. Now in banking and finance, we talk about sort of, you know, regulation and Yost, you know, I mean, Yost, Yost can 
sit there and just go through <laughs> several scary examples of how just the regulatory model has not worked in favor of new competition and, and, innovative, and, and innovative consumer benefits. It's 2015, people. <laughs> I mean, the world has changed and the, the competition is not just coming from another bank, it's coming from technology provi providers of all kinds and it's coming from every market, every geographic market. So I think that part of the reason culturally that we haven't been, that we don't adopt innovation as really just part of our everyday being is that we haven't really had to. It's just not something that we've really ever had to do. Uh, we've been touched by war, but we haven't really been sort of affected by it like an Israel has. And Israel's got one of the most innovative and globally intimidating tech sectors in the world today, which it has built, by the way, in about 25 years and through policy direction from several successive and different governments. So the consistency of policy throughout two and a half decades in Israel has made a massive difference in harnessing the intellectual capital of a small nation that is, by the way, incredibly well connected to Silicon Valley and, and New York, to the East Coast. So again, that global mindset. So again, you've got, you've, you've got a country that desired to make intellectual capital and the services and the benefits that came from that intellectual capital of value to its economy moving forward and they started to go and do something about it. We haven't done that yet here. I think there are voices that are becoming incredibly strong, but they need to become more consistent, stronger, and our leadership and the leadership of the banks and the leadership of our policymakers, they have to start looking around and saying, okay, really, it's 2015. These things are universally, the competition that we're living in is fact. What is Australia going to do when it grows up in that capacity? And one of the things I noted this morning, I think was Peter, I'm pretty sure it was Peter that said it, but he was talking about the real problem of financial illit illiteracy that's there. Um, and that may be so. I wasn't aware that that was the case, so that's interesting to me. But from where I'm sitting, I would also argue that in the Australian banking and finance environment, at the board and operational level, at the leadership m level, there is actually an innovation illiteracy. And I think that that also has to be really, really closely, it has to be built up. And part of that literacy for innovation and tech-driven disruption for these big banks that have had a fairly nice, fairly nice life. And one of the things that, oh, one of the things that drives me crazy is like Westpac, Westpac keeps calling itself a 200-year-old startup. I mean, it keeps saying that with a straight face. I just don't know how it can, <laughs> it can if you're a 200 years old startup, then you're not a startup. <laughs> but um, what I'm saying is that the, the literacy that the banks can get is increasingly coming from the disruptive startup classes. That's how they can get it, by engaging with them, by opening up, up to them. Um, it, 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 it's got to start happening, otherwise, as Yost, as Yost says, and I couldn't agree more, well, I mean, Yost said, I think in 2004, you thought we were ahead of the game in, in sort of a regulatory open model, and just in, what, you know, 10 years, we're now lagging behind. We're lagging behind in a lot of that sort of technology, innovation, disruption, um, uh, you know, the, any sort of comparative global study. We are dropping several points. Um, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to hear more from the panel about, about how do we move forward to make innovation and competitiveness rather than, I mean, not, we're not negating safety and security, but we have gone too far one way. We really have to decide what is innovation, what is tech-driven disruption, how, does it, how is it hitting us, how fast is it hitting us, and it's not just about uh, whether we're competing with each other here, we're competing with the world, and it's coming down the pike in a big, big, fast way. So that's it.
it. Just. Well, I, I can't resist, uh, Sandy, you commented on the uh, illiteracy of the uh, Australian consumer. Now, I'm really very passionate about it. It is the responsibility of the banks to market safe products. It's not the responsibility of the consumer. Okay, the, mop, the BMW is responsible for a safe car, not me when I buy it. So the ownership for security is only with the banks, not with the consumer. It's scandalizing how we have abused the fact that a pharmacist is a pharmacist and not a financial specialist. Our customers, we owe them safe products. As much as I want to uh, reiterate, to be a, a good, honest corporate citizen is a responsibility of the banks. It's not a responsibility of regulators catching them. So we have to uh, kind of uh, think about what our responsibilities uh, are in the community. It's safe products and responsible conduct, and we are missing big. So following on from that, I can think of 30 billion reasons why the banks want to maintain the status quo. A and that gets, to, that gets to the profit motive. And that's not to say that as a startup we're not profit motivated. But when you look uh, at sort of you know, your comments there, you have to, it's not just about the banks and the underlying products. It's the incentives that exist within the system. So why is it that a car dealer makes more money out of the financing of the motor vehicle than they do out of the actual sale of the vehicle itself? Why is it that I can walk into JB and say, I'd like to buy that MacBook, but I don't have $2,000. What can you do for me? How about $60 a week? Okay, that sounds great. I can afford $60 a week. But hang on, after a year, that's $3,000. And then there's a balloon of $1,000 at the end for me to be able to buy the MacBook. So it's, it's this issue with financial literacy, but it's actually the incentives that exist within the system and the predatory behavior that exists either overtly or covertly that's taking advantage of a consumer that's not aware. A and that's on, that's on all participants. Anybody, anybody else want to? Uh, oh, Keith, Belinda. You know, I was going to say, I mean, the, the predatory behavior is an, an interesting uh, thought. We've had, we've had a few themes. We talked about trust, and trust seems to be as between an individual supplier. Regulators tend, I think, to talk more about confidence that if trust breaks beyond a certain level, you seem to have confidence in the system. And that, I think, that, that brings you to that notion of, well, where, where is the risk? So the third thing we talked about is risk. There's a heap of risk aversion in the system. Um, but it does behove, um, I think your, your word, Kingsley, was... Um, the whole body po politics signing on to risk, that you cannot have a system where no one is going to trip and no one is going to get hurt. Um, in the health system, perhaps you can a bit, but accidents happen, people still die. In the financial system, oh. similarly, there will be people that find that uh, often because they believe that they're they really wanted to, in the car dealership to buy the Maserati and hey, the Maserati crashed, um, there is a literacy. So I don't agree with Austin saying, really, it's just the supplier's problem. It is a purchaser's problem. And surely there is some great disruption available in providing that intermediation to a level that consumers can understand. And I, that, I know it's a bit of what you're on about then in, in AWA. But I think it's, it's really important to get if the banks can't provide that intermediation that gives people a trust, then I, I think we're seeing increasingly people are prepared to pay, and, and particularly younger people who are more adroit electronically prepared to um, pay to get that comprehension and that ticket and comfort. Thank you. Now, from the floor, uh, we've had a very patient audience. Uh, so please, uh, you, sir, over there. I think Belinda makes a very good point there on You might want to just move the microphone. To, sorry to interrupt. Sorry, I, th I think Belinda makes a very good point there about financial literacy and the fact that it is both a risk and reward system. And I, for one, would not be dissatisfied uh, if the uh, 
it wasn't the com complex mathematics that was being taught in school, but simply the concept of risk and reward and the fact you can't have one without the other. I think, it, I think as, as Jos says, it is beho behoven of, um, of product creators to do an element of that. It is also a consumer element of that, and it is a government element of that, particularly in a circumstance like Australia where you have compulsory superannuation. So if we're going to effectively mandate that you have some sort of investment, there, there really should be the trade-off that we also provide you with the, the most basic tools to engage with that. Um, in that it is a risk and reward system, and we've talked about data as a disinfectant, which I thought was, was, was excellent, um, Stuart talked about the, the regulator creating trust. Um, I'm not sure that regulators create trust. I, I think regulators, to an extent, create compliance. And, and, and Jos talked about the culture of the banks in, in exactly in gaming that compliance. So I suppose my, my question is, what, are the, what suggestions do you have in changing that culture amongst the big players and within the system to promote trust rather than simply compliance? And is, is regulation the best tool to be doing that? So from a regulatory perspective, there is a massive risk aversion to protecting against downsized risk. Don't want a failure on my watch. And what that means then is that you're always catering to the lowest common denominator. We must rule out everything that's possible because one act or one instance blew up something somewhere way over there. And even though that's not likely to happen again, <laughs> but let's just regulate it so that nobody can do anything. Um, and so it's about having an open conversation around what type of regulation do we want? And how can we have proactive as opposed to reactive regulation? But also, how can we, ex how can we actually acknowledge that some failure is acceptable? So take peer-to-peer -peer lending. It would be perfectly fine to say, we think this is great, this is a new industry, we don't know how to regulate it. You guys can lend $100 million, $50 million, pick an amount. And we're going to check in with you every month. And we're going to keep our eye on you. And we'd like you to work with us and tell you how we think this should be regulated. That's actually a really progressive approach that enables innovation to foster. And then in terms of how is it that you then sort of, you know, adhere compliance on that, you, you, you ensure that compliance is wielded with a stick. So you must penalise bad actors. You must penalise people who are taking advantage. Yoss. Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm far from claiming to be a specialist, but the first thing that uh, comes to my mind is we had very gratifying experience with the Australian Prudential Regulator because there they said, uh, this is our legitimate outcome that we want, but we, live, we let you, an innovative new company, choose the way how you deliver the outcome. So smart regulation that is concentrated on outcomes seems uh, for me uh, to be best uh, practice. Take the example of the interchange. I mean, I heard the Reserve Bank saying, what we want is a 50 basis points cap. And we don't want you to game, or, uh, game around. And uh, so uh, how that technically works, I refer to the lawyers. I do not know. It's a complicated stuff. I mean, uh, across the globe, everybody is competing on regulatory excellency. That's one of the major competition fields. So another thing that is very dear to my heart is, so this, this makes a little bit the difference between just complying by the letter versus by the outcome. The other one is I, I'm just appalled by self-funding litigations and get-away culture, which is nurtured because I think the regulatory and legal framework doesn't have enough teeth here. So me as a small competitor against dominant, broad-line, big institutions, they can stifle me in a million ways which legalistically I will never be able uh, to protect myself against. I mean, they, they, this, is, this is unreal, but I would, like, I would like to have a significant risk perception in the bank institution that if they overplay their game, this is going to hurt the bank institution and the careers in the bank institution. And I'm not trusting that ACCC and uh, uh, ASIC have in... The, the large institutions are not impressed enough by the risk that they engage with if they misbehave. 
The only one I think that is highly respected is, is APRA. But APRA can medicate easily significant pain. That seems for me a good explanation why they are so respected. Uh, can I thank all the panel members? Um, I've got some comments. I, I enjoyed all what you had to said, say. Um, just in relation, Sandy hit some buttons for me. Um, Australia uh, definitely uh, has a, is an importer of capital and has some uh, challenges in terms of attracting that capital. And certainly, that you know, being an importer of capital is something that's come out in the in the final report. Um, I think some of the issues in terms of when you think about innovation in Australia, it's to do with regulatory or political risk that you take super for example and so there's some change to super in every single budget every year without right. fail um, sometimes there seems to be a lack of willingness by our politicians to take appropriate risks and one example which is outside of the finance industry directly is the nuclear question mm -hmm. um, but but that hits other buttons for people I think as well um, university culture and research that government programs need to be much more um, significantly tied to um, commercialisation of work and, and we just don't, we, we certainly have a high quality academic uh, group of institutions but we don't necessarily cater as well as say US universities or Israeli universities in terms of innovation. Um, you mentioned about, uh, actually you, you mentioned uh, since 2004, um, we've had five Prime Ministers since that time, that's a problem. Um, and just to sum up on, on the last thing is, I think the tax white paper is coming, but the, the, the taxation structure and the political system with which policies do and don't get implemented, I think are a major stifling of innovation in Australia. And I know that this is a financial regulatory issue, but I don't think that um, we can't consider it holistically. I think, um, I mean, there's so many, so many things there, um, but I'll try to, to, to try and encapsulate it. Definitely the quality of, inte uh, of, of intellectual capital in, a, in our university system is, is very strong. Where, we, where we're woefully not good, I mean, we're woeful, is um, the collaboration between, um, well, the commercialization of university research, um, but also the collaboration between universities and industry to solve a problem and to go after a market. So that, that is a very big deal. It's been talked about more and more lately. Um, some, some of the universities have done very, very good work. I mean, we've literally got a, got a situation in Australia for several, several decades now where a university researcher, world class, who wants to go into the commercial sector, into the private sector to maybe commercialize his research, will in fact be penalized by the university in various ways if he or she wants to go back into it. I mean, that's, I mean, very simplistic. There's a whole heap of other stuff. Now, these things are not that hard to address. You can actually put in play new, new systems and new cultures, um, you know, to, 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 to readdress those issues. Um, the other thing is the inconsistency of policy or, you know, so, many, so much leadership. Yes, that is a very, very big deal, but I also think what's even more a big deal is in, in terms of the policy end is, I mean, again, a lack of, a lack of brains, you know, a brain space for the value of innovation and entrepreneurial and, and, and growth cultures. Um, I was having an interview with several uh, policy leaders uh, this week and, and some were better than others, but, but, um, that, but I can't tell you how often when the word innovation ecosystem or, uh, you know, uh, you know, they love crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is oh, big, you know. But, um, but, but innovation ecosystem, every time they said a word like that, they were, oh, that's an overused word. Oh, that's, a, that's an overused, that's overused. Now, I agree that innovation and ecosystem and those might be overused words, but they actually do have meaning. And my argument would be that isn't it, if, the, if, if, if policymakers think they're overused, isn't it, isn't it the first part of their job is to help define that and what it means for their constituents? I mean, really, don't just stand there and tell me something's overused, give me a better, better word or frame it differently. It's just lazy policy and it's really annoying. 
So the capital side of it, though, is one of the things that venture capital in tech, tech-driven venture capital affair, has not been very successful since its real advent, say, 20, 20 years ago. Part of the reason is it's really hard to do it well. Um, it's a, and really well-intentioned and, 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 and well-experienced people have been, in, been involved. So it's not about, you know, thinking that this was a game. It's hard. There's only a few big winners that, that can make a fund successful. But a little knowledge has been a dangerous thing. We have not yet developed in Australia enough of the investment knows for tech that other markets have taken decades and decades and decades to build up. So we've really got to start focusing on what we know and what we don't know and being know how to partner and reach out to other markets and other fields of expertise and not think we can just do it all homegrown if you're in our own little way. It's got to be collaborative and it's got to be built over time and, con and it requires consistent leadership and consistent policy settings to do that. Just, just can I add just a clarification? I, I agree in, entirely. Um, what we do really well in Australia, although we could still do better, is the medical sciences area is really well looked after in terms of academic and commercialisation. Um, I'll disclose I'm a finance professor, but certainly when it comes to business, and this is a financial system inquiry, um, there's a lot of, I mean, we, there's 40% of the economy is, uh, is the banking financial services sector. I mean, it's a significant part of our um, economic value add, um, yet government significantly underfunds um, innovation, commercialisation in the financial business context. That's just a comment. Yeah, no, I, I agree. That's great. So I'm um, going to crave your indulgence with maybe an extra five minutes because we did start late before going to lunch. Um, but we have a remaining task to complete before we sum up. Uh, and that is, of course, the recommendations, which we haven't touched yet. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, this is in the grand tradition of, 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 of any university student crammed before the exam. Um, and what, what I aim to do here is do this Malcolm Gladwell blink fashion. So what, what I'm going to do for everybody in the room is I'm simply going to read verbatim what the, uh, what, what the actual recommendation is. And then I want your quick reaction. And it's really first come, first serve to the microphone in terms of what you want to say as an impression about that particular recommendation. So that's the rules, um, and we'll, we'll get through this quite quickly. So the first one, I'm going to actually read these out for you. Um, everybody, just to help folks, ah, they're up there? They are up there. Yeah. They're kind of up there. Uh, yes, we're just doing the innovation ones. I'm not going to do all 44. Um, I'm going to have to contain myself about the first recommendation because I think it mentions the word committee. <laughs> but here we go. All right. So is everyone comfortable with this? Yeah. So if you're on a table, you're going to have to grab that microphone. So don't have it too far. Oh, you guys over there, you behind you. I think you should move the microphone closer to where you are. Okay, here we go. All right. So first one, collaboration to enable innovation Establish a permanent public-private sector collaborative committee. <laughs> the, quote, innovation collaboration to facilitate financial system innovation and enable timely and coordinated policy and regulatory responses. So, who's our right idea? Just don't let it drag on, let it be outcome-focused. Not only that, but intent is good, but these things really depend on who's on that committee what do they know and how diversified, what is the diversified skill set? Does that skill set, it, it, it doesn't matter if you've got collaboration between a bunch of people who think exactly the same. CEOs of the four banks. <laughs> right, exactly. From the floor, from the floor now, <laughs> quick. Anybody? No? Ah, okay. Well, blink on then. Um, digital identity, develop a national strategy for a federated style Federated, let me put emphasis on that word. This is not any ordinary, this is a federated style model of trusted digital identities. Yeah. But people like that? I, I got nods. Yeah, okay. People like that one. Clearer graduated payments regulation. This one, this one's actually, this one's a doozy. 
enhance graduation of retail payments regulation by clarifying thresholds for regulation by the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, that would be ASIC, uh, the Australian Prudential Regulation Authority, that would be APRA, strengthen consumer protection by mandating the e-payments code, introduce a separate prudential regime with two tiers for purchase payment facilities. A lot going on there. Ah, they, uh, th that's absolutely a, a must. Unfortunately, we were backtracking there because we had a specialised regime that was just scanned effective 1st of uh, January 2015. There has to be, you can play around, then there has to be, uh, you can develop the model up to certain risk that you inject into the system, and then you are regulated as a special institution, then you are regulated as a general institution. I mean, it's absolutely clear and staring at me, because the same regulatory weight cannot hit you or me. We had a different phase and we inject different risk. So it's obviously, it's staring at me, I'm perplexed while we go backwards on it, I, I don't understand. Next one. <laughs> Interchange fees and customer surcharging. <laughs> this is a tiny print. I improve interchange fee regulation by clarifying thresholds for when they apply, broadening the range of fees and payments they apply to, and lowering interchange fees. Improve surcharging regulation by expanding this application, ensuring customers using lower cost payment methods cannot be over surcharged by allowing more prescriptive limits on surcharging. This, this, this is an obvious other non-brainer. There is huge political dividend uh, in it. I explained the abuse of the interchange system that has to end because it penalizes small, medium enterprises and low-income Australians. The whole surcharging debate is the most vexing aspect of the retail payment system. Everybody has, uh, no, this is a wrong English word, with it. Uh, so, uh, the two are connected. The easiest way to get rid of all these complexities can the interchange fee or reduce it to an insignificant amount because you immediately get rid of the surcharging. The surcharging is merely the reversing of the abuse interchange fee. So, you have two fl flies, are we saying? In this two, you, you resolve two problems with an easy, simple measure. It does hurt the banks because it cuts one of their most sweetest cross-subsidy that they have uh, gotten used to. Okay. Uh, oh, just in relation to the surcharging recommendation, I don't think it will be effective unless there's an, uh, a clear place for a consumer to complain to. Next one. Okay. Crowdfunding. Graduate fundraising regulation to facilitate crowdfunding for both debt and equity and over time other forms of financing. Yay. Let's go for it. Proud loves crowdfunding. Data <laughs> access and use. Uh, review the costs and benefits of increasing access to and improving the use of data, taking into account community concerns about appropriate privacy protection. More data is good data. People like it. Yes? Cool? I'm all for data. I'm a bit of a data junkie. Just as, long as it's just as long as it's more, people often confuse big data and the power of big data and the way Ian described it is absolutely right, but people are sort of confusing big data with recommendation engines and they're not the same thing, I mean. Yeah, and we have to learn to say it right, it's data. Yeah, sorry, <laughs> did I say data? Oh my God. I'm data, sorry. data. Data. <laughs> data, something. <laughs> Comprehensive credit reporting and then lunch. Support <laughs> industry efforts to expand credit data sharing under the new voluntary comprehensive credit reporting regime. If over time participation is inadequate, government should consider legislating mandatory participation. But don't wait, just make it mandatory. The reality is that this is a space that the banks have uh, significant strength and, and a strong disincentive to participate. This is about access to data, this is about fairness to, to all and enables people to be able to price risk uh, accordingly. Fantastic. Okay, so just to wind up and sum up, thank you. You've all been very patient. We're about to go to lunch. Um, our theme was engaged, adaptive, grounded regulation. And I, I think I would close on, on being quite grounded about what disruption really means. Um, it's actually quite fine to piss people off. That's part of the way the world works. Um, and if you're starting a new business, don't expect everyone to love you. 
first off the bat when you get out there and start competing? 